Good morning. It's not Ben. Jason here. Hey, we're standing out here in the sanctuary, outside of the sanctuary, uh, in the the new foyer, which will be what we're looking at is the new kids check-in. We're standing in the welcome desk right now, but we're really, it's really coming along. It looks good. They're putting brick up right now. The ramp's about to go in. So a lot of cool things going on, but we just want to welcome you. If you're on YouTube or Facebook Live, we're glad you're here worshiping with us. Here at 24 Church, we are, our saying is that we are gospel family and mission, like we are a family on mission for the gospel, to reach people for the name of Jesus Christ. So, what we would love for you to do, if you're new, is go right here. If you want to touch your screen right here, it's not going to work. But go to 24church.com. Let's connect in red. There is a name who reigns without contention. Whose power can't be questioned or contained With humble fame He rules the earth and heavens His glory knows no measure or refrain And it's bursting past the borderlines of space Enthroned upon the praises of our heart Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it all There is a name And he's reaching past the margin Calling sons and daughters back to him As he saves You can hear the roar of heaven As prodigals are coming again Oh, the triumph of his name will never end Jesus of our hearts. Oh, Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it all. Who reigns 
without contention, whose power can't be questioned or contained with humble faith. Oh, he rules the earth and heavens, his glory knows no measure or refrain. And it's bursting past the borderlines of space.
hey, we're in kids' church, or what used to be kids' church is now going to be kind become a uh, kind of a multifunction area where kids are going to meet and where students are going to meet on Wednesday nights. Our kitchen's attached to it. Um, it's going to be a really cool place, as you can see the stage behind us. Um, we just want to talk about the Worth, Worth It initiative, that the things, the money that you've been given is going to things like this. And if you drive by, you can drive up here and you can look at all the stuff that your money that you've been giving to this initiative and what it's doing. And so we really look forward to it. Um, but we, we continue to need money. And so there's four ways that you can give. Three of them are digital and one is old school. So the three ways you can give online at 24church.com, you can give on the church app or you can text um, a, an offering, or you can old school snail mail, lick and put a stamp on it and send it right in. Good morning, 24 Church. My name is Ben and I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm normally neck deep in micro church stuff and in communications, uh, but I get to teach from time to time and I'm always excited for the chance to, uh, to study and to teach and preach God's word. So um, super, just, you know, honored to be with you this morning. Um, believe it or not, we're now like 11 weeks into uh, this situation where we're online only. And um, uh, I'm sure you're feeling kind of like I am, one, a little bit just kind of overwhelmed by the lack of personal interaction. Uh, just, man, meeting digitally is not the same. Uh, and at the same time, hopeful that as our country's starting to reopen the economy, that things are going to get back to normal sooner rather than later. Uh, I just want you to know, as pastors, we're wrestling through those questions and trying to make the right decisions uh, for us to be safe, while also kind of, you know, understanding the situation we're in with our building right now, which is kind of half torn apart. Um, but man, it's super exciting. Big decisions are made every single week um, as we're watching this thing transform. And so as soon as we're able to be back together, we will be. Uh, and uh, we would appreciate your prayers in that. Uh, you know, if you're feeling just a little bit overwhelmed, I want to encourage you not to lose heart and to press in um, in this weird place that we're in as a country. Um, we're going to be looking today at Luke 18, and we're going to be studying a parable together. So I want to go ahead and invite you to turn to Luke 18, the very beginning of the chapter. And as you do that, uh, I want us just to talk for a second about what a parable is. I don't know if you've ever thought about that question. What is a parable? I know I've heard it taught at least a couple times, not here, but in other places where people go, you know, Jesus intentionally taught in parables to make it really easy for people to understand what he was talking about. He told stories so that they would understand. And that's not completely true. I mean, Jesus kind of uh, contradicts that. It actually says in Luke 8, 9 and 10, it says um, his disciple, he told a parable and his disciples came and asked him. And, uh, and it says this, it says, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others, they're in parables. And listen to what Jesus says. So that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So in some ways, Jesus says he's telling parables so that people won't see and won't understand. And that seems really strange. So what is a parable? What's he getting at? And I have a few quotes from, um, commentators here that help us. But Leon Morris says this, he says, a parable may take the form of a story or a simile or a metaphor. It's an appeal from what people already know in the realm of ordinary life to truths that Jesus wants to teach them in spiritual life. And then R.T. France says this, he says, a parable is an utterance which does not carry its meaning on the surface and which thus demands thought and perception if the hearer is to benefit from it. In other words, Jesus is telling parables to make us think. Maybe you've had a school teacher like this who, who almost kind of teases an idea, but doesn't give you the whole idea yet and kind of makes her students uh, or his students think a little bit, makes you dig in, and then that draws you in and, and you actually learn more because your attention was was peaked just a little bit and made you think. That's what a parable is doing. It's not carrying the meaning right on the surface. It's making us dig down deeper. Uh, my brother actually says this, Andy, he's a pastor in Birmingham, and he says, every parable is in some way 
a call to repentance and deeper faith in God. To discover the meaning of a parable then is not simply to understand it at face value, it's to believe it and to respond in obedience. So parables are making us think so that our faith would be challenged and we would be changed as a result of thinking about this story. Uh, So that's some stuff on parables. Let's read this one together uh, in Luke 18. And I actually want to pray for us right before we do that. So let's pray together and then we'll dip in and read this together. Jesus, I pray that this morning as we uh, are studying your word, Lord, you know what's on every single heart scattered around our community. I have no idea. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak directly to every single person what they desperately need to hear. Lord, challenge us where we need to be challenged. Lord, help our faith to deepen in you this morning. Lord, and if there's any person here that's joining us and they don't yet know you, Lord, I pray that you'd reveal yourself to them in a powerful way and that you'd save them today. Lord, help us as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're in Luke 18, and we're reading the parable of the persistent widow, and it's just the first eight verses. I'm going to read them here together for us. And it says this. It says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and to not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect? who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? Okay. So today in in this parable, we're going to see several different comparisons. Comparisons can be fun. A couple that I'll throw out here for you, you know, uh, Coke versus Pepsi. Which which side are you on? Uh, Right now we're all watching the last dance. Is it, is it Michael Jordan or is it LeBron James? Uh, where do you fall? Uh, if, if you're a, uh, is it Tennessee football or is it Vanderbilt football? Uh, or if you're from my family, you know, is it, is it the Mississippi State Bulldogs, Hale State, or is it a school that shall not be mentioned? Uh, you know, all these comparisons are fun things to think about. Well, in this parable, we're going to see that there are really three comparisons that I think Jesus wants us to make. He wants us to see a comparison between the unrighteous judge in the story and our heavenly father, the righteous judge in heaven. That's the first one. The second comparison is he wants us to see the comparison between the persistent widow and ourselves and specifically how we pray. And then the third comparison is between what Jesus says the truth is in this passage and then what our reality seems to be because sometimes they're not They don't seem to be the same thing. And so I want us to think through that issue together. Uh, The truth is, is that there's a lot of things in Christianity, in the Christian walk, where Jesus is saying this truth, or we perceive there to be truth here, but we, we can't physically see it or prove it. And sometimes that dissonance between what we know is true and then what our reality right now seems to be is hard to deal with. Um, when I was seven years old, I'd probably heard the gospel a hundred times. Uh, but when I was about seven, I came home from church one day and I felt the spirit of God speaking to my heart. And to be truthful, I, I couldn't see God, but somehow I could perceive that what was going on was real. And I placed faith in Jesus for the very first time that day. And throughout our Christian walk, every single step of the way, there's faith decision after faith decision after faith decision. It's not like we just need faith once. We need faith every single day. And especially when Jesus is saying, this is the truth of the reality. This is what's real, but it sure seems like in our life, it's something different. So what should we do 
when that's going on. So we're going to see that comparison in this parable as well. But let's, let's jump into the first one, and that's the unrighteous judge and the righteous judge. So in verse 2, uh, it says this. He says, uh, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. That's who this judge is. A few commentators here. Uh, Leon Moore says, a judge who neither feared God nor regarded man was controlled by his own ideas and inclinations. William Hendrickson says, he was nothing but a hateful egotist. Here then is a judge without any love for justice, and he has no sympathy for the oppressed, and in his capacity as judge, though he might help people who needed it, he did not know what sympathy was. Tender feelings were completely foreign to him. And then I. Howard Marshall says, although the judge was legally required to give precedence to a widow's case, he was either unwilling to do so, perhaps because he was lazy, or he just wouldn't dare. That's this judge. We've all known somebody like this. They seem out for themselves only. That's, well, that, they really just care about themselves. They're not really concerned about justice for others. Um, they're just selfish and self-seeking. It goes on in this story, and we see that the judge finally does give this widow justice, but he does so really reluctantly. It says in verses four and five, for a while he refused to give her justice. But afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. When this judge finally does do something right, it's still a selfish motive. It's still just because he's sick of her annoying him to death. You know, she keeps tagging him on Twitter. She keeps dropping DMs on his Instagram. She is after this judge to give her justice. She keeps bothering him. And finally, not because he wants to do what's right, finally, just because he's like, I'm sick of dealing with this woman, he finally relents and gives her justice. That's the unrighteous judge. But we need to compare that unrighteous judge to the righteous judge. Look at verses six through eight. It says, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. That's what we just heard. And then he says this, and he says, and will not God, you know, our father, give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will certainly give justice to them speedily. Jesus compares this unrighteous judge to his father in heaven, and he says, they're nothing alike. Leon Morris helps us here, and he says, this parable is the how much more type of parable. If a wicked man will sometimes do good, even from bad motives, how much more will God do what is right every single time? The Bidi Anyabwile says this. He says, if an unrighteous judge who fears no one is eventually moved by persistent pleading, how much more does a righteous God, moved by compassion, goodness, mercy, and faith, hear the prayers of his people who pray night and day, Contrary to the human judge's slowness, God gives justice swiftly. I mean, what do we know about the character of God from Scripture? We know that God our Father always does what's right. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He won't by no means clear the unjust, but he loves to pour out grace and mercy. So God our Father always does right, and, and he loves to give grace and mercy. He's nothing like this unrighteous judge. The second comparison I want you to see today is the persistent widow and us. So here's what the text says about the persistent widow. In verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse three, it says, there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. What do we know about widows in those days? Again, commentators are going to help us here. Leon Moore says, the widow in those days was almost a symbol of helplessness. She was in no position to bribe the judge, and she had no protector to bring pressure to bear on him. She was armed with nothing but the fact that right was evidently on her side. She did not ask for vengeance. She just asked for justice, and she persisted in that. The beady 
In our Lord's day, a widow lived in near complete dependence on others. She had no family and likely no income. The parable implies that she has at least one enemy who opposes her. William Hendrickson, the widow had been unjustly treated. Someone may have deprived her of what little she had or may have prevented her from receiving uh, that to which she was entitled. So she went to the judge, hoping that he would confirm her claim and give her whatever justice demanded. This would probably also imply punishment for her opponent. But the emphasis is rather on the urgent request by the wrong widow that she is, wants to receive her due. And, and William Hendrickson says, uh, he further says, this judge probably knew that what the woman was asking for was just and right. But he also knew that she was unable to bribe him and had little or no influence in the city. We know somebody like this probably too. We know somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of family or no family around. They're poor. As far as society counts things, they're rather insignificant. And there's not a lot that they can do to change their situation. They're just in the situation that they're in. And it's hard. But this parable also wants to point out not just that that was the widow's situation, but that she was a persistent widow. Verse three says, there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. She kept coming. She kept crying out and asking this judge for what was right. And the parable wants us to compare her to ourselves. We know that because of the first and last verse in the parable. The first verse says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and to not lose heart. So the same way that the widow was persistent, we ought always to pray and to not lose heart. And then in verse eight, it says, I tell you, God will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, so when Jesus returns again, he asks us this question, will he find faith on earth? Really, this parable is asking us three questions about ourselves. Will we continue in prayer? Will we not lose heart? And will we have faith that perseveres? They're kind of all the same question from different angles. You know, if we have persevering faith, then we will continue in prayer. If we do not lose heart, then we show that we have persevering faith. If we pray persistently, then we have not lost heart. It's kind of all pointing to the same thing. And Jesus wants us in this parable to ask ourselves, will we be persistent the way that the widow was persistent? Because our father is nothing like the unrighteous judge in this parable. He loves to answer our prayers. He loves to listen to our prayers. So will we persist? The third comparison that I want us to see today is again between what Jesus says is the truth here and what we see. Now, the first thing I want to point out is some context here. Again, in verse one, it says, them, it says, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and to not lose heart. So Jesus knows that the situation they're in is one in which the people that are listening could be tempted to lose heart. If we look back in chapter 17, Jesus is talking a lot about the end times and the coming of the kingdom. And it, it's this passage that a lot of you've heard. And he says, that, you know, they were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah and the ark, the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in those days, uh, for them, it will be when the Lord returns. You know, so he's, he's referring a lot in the chapter right before this parable to the end times. And it seems, Jesus knows the truth. Here's one of the mysteries of the New Testament. That Jesus' first coming and his second coming, we're going to have a huge gap in between them. The way the Old Testament thought about the coming of the Messiah was it thought about it as one big event. The Messiah is going to come set all things back right, and reign over us like David. They didn't realize at that time that the Messiah was going to come and a church was going to be birthed and the message of the gospel was going to go forth into all the world so that the church could grow larger and larger and more and more people could become a part of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus was going to return again and fix everything and set it back right. 
they still didn't realize this at this time, but Jesus did. And so he's warning them that in this time that we're in right now, the church age, the kingdom of God is advancing, but everything is not back right the way that it should be. As C.S. Lewis famously said, you know, if, if we can imagine a world that's, that's better than the one we're living in, that's not like this, then it's because our hearts were made for a better world, a different world. We were not made for the world as it is right now. We await a kingdom. We await the arrival of Jesus when he's going to set all things back right. We await, await a time when COVID-19 is not ravaging the country and the world. And when there isn't injustice. But right now, we live in the in-between time. And we can be tempted in this in-between time to lose heart, to not persist in prayers, to not persist in having faith. And Jesus knows that we're going to be in this in-between time, and he wants us to not lose heart. So that's the first thing that's really important. But the other thing that I want to remind you here is just ask some questions. You know, he wants us to persist. He wants us to be in, like the widow. He ends the parable by asking this question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So he wants us to cry out to him regularly in prayer and to persist. Okay, so here's what I want to ask, kind of in, in winding down this sermon. What, what are the reasons that we don't persist in prayer? And, and I've come up with six that I want to share with you. And as you hear these, you may be challenged and you may, be go, you may go, that's me a little bit. And if you're challenged by these reasons that maybe sometimes you don't pray the way that you ought to, I want to encourage you to, to repent and to believe the gospel, and to realize the goodness of God, and how much it's important for you to pray, and to not lose heart. So let's go through these, and, and we're just going to examine our hearts together. But the first reason that we might not persist in prayer the way that this widow persisted, is that we doubt the goodness of God to help us. So we picture God more like the unrighteous judge, rather than our perfect heavenly father. This was the original temptation in the garden. The, the serpent came to Eve and he started making her doubt the goodness of God. Did, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And why, why would he do that? He's just, he's not looking out for your good. He wants to keep good things from you, Eve. You should take, you should take that apple and eat because he's not looking out for your best. He's not a perfect father. And sometimes we don't pray because we forget how much we have a, a heavenly father who loves us and loves to shower us with good gifts. And I want to encourage you to believe the truth about who God is, that he's a perfect heavenly father, that the way Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and love them is the way that God, the father looks at us, that the way on Jesus baptism, when Jesus was baptized and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's how he feels about you and about me for in Christ. He loves us and he's a perfect judge, not like the judge in this story. The second reason that we might not persevere in prayer is that we're scared that we're annoying God. Maybe we're scared that we, we've asked and it doesn't seem like he's answered and, and we're scared that we're, we're pestering him. The way that sometimes our kids just like pester us to death. And so we're like, well, I don't, I don't want to, I want to pester God. And we're scared that we're pestering him, but he gives us this parable right here so that we'll be reminded that he actually wants us to persist in prayer. And that if he doesn't answer us immediately, he's got a good reason for that. But he's not sick of our spending time with him. He's not sick of our asking him for things. He's not sick of our, of our seeking his will. We're not pestering God when we pray. And so I want to encourage you, don't, don't believe that. A third reason we might not persist in prayer is that we're kind of, if we're honest, maybe we wouldn't say this out loud, but we kind of feel like prayer doesn't work. We kind of feel like maybe God's powerless or maybe he just doesn't want to move in this or I don't know. And we, we become just a little bit like, I don't, I don't know if it really matters one way or another if I pray. And I want to encourage you, the, throughout the pages of the Bible, we see things like this in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. God desperately wants to hear the prayers of his people. He does care. It does work. 
Some, he doesn't always answer our prayer the way that we would want, but he always answers us. It's, it's yes, no, or wait. <laughs> you don't see as clearly as I see, so I need you to wait. But he wants to hear our prayers. They do work, and he, he will either answer our prayer in time or he'll align our hearts to, to want what he wants for us if we can see everything that he sees for our lives. You know, uh, when I was reading commentators on this passage, when I was reading the Bidi on Yabwile, he talked about how much prayer was a part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s civil rights movement in the 60s. Be- because the, the immediate context of this parable is actually praying or crying out for justice. I, I believe the parable applies to all prayer, but the immediate context is asking for justice, which is what King was doing. He was asking for for equal rights for all people. He was crying out for justice. And I didn't know it till I read the BD, but prayer was a major part of Dr. King's ministry and, and marches. And, and here's what the BD says. I think this is just so important because we live in days that are unjust in many ways. And it, it, we should cry out and ask God for justice. But here's what the BD says. He says, the surest way to get justice in this world for God's people is not by marching, Though marching may have its place, the surest way to achieve justice in this world is not by protest signs, though those also may be appropriate. The surest way to find justice is never by rioting or burning down your neighborhood. Justice comes most surely by falling on our knees with our heads bowed. When God's justice comes, it will be perfect, proportionate, and balanced. And then he goes on to say this. He says, pray for justice. We do more on our knees with our voices lifted in prayer than we do on our feet marching with our voices lifted in protest. We ought to protest in righteous causes that demand it, but we ought never to protest without praying before, during, and after. Do we have the persistent widow's kind of faith in seeking God? Prayer really does work. Believe that. The fourth reason we might not persist in prayer is that sometimes the enemy or our own guilty conscience makes us feel like we don't have a right to even talk to God. Have you ever been there before? You're like, man, I would pray, but, but I'm just so jacked up that I don't believe God even wants to hear from a person like me. I've been there before, but if you're in Christ, that's not the truth about how God feels about you. And it's not the truth about your access to God and your ability to pray for him, to him. Hebrews 4 says this, talking about Jesus, it says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, listen to what Jesus, what the writer Hebrews says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you've got open, unrepentant sin in your life, I want to encourage you to confess that and know that 1 John 1, 9 applies to you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to draw near to God. That's what James says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Don't for a second believe that God doesn't welcome you with open arms into his family. He's, he's like the father in the parable, the prodigal son, he's like the father who's waiting and he loves for us to draw close to him. And it doesn't matter how jacked up you are, how jacked up your life is. God wants to forgive you. If you will cry out and ask for forgiveness and draw near to him and pray to him, he will listen. He loves to hear from us. So don't believe that reason either. The fifth reason we might not persist in prayer is that we're just not sure how to pray. Some of you are like, man, I, I would do that. Like, I know I should, but, but I, don't, I don't know the right words to, spe- to speak. And, and I don't sound as good as, as the people that pray on Sunday morning or, or my dad. You know, he was really good at praying for the prayer, but I don't know all those words. I'm not that eloquent. I don't know how to pray. But listen to this. In Romans 8, it says that the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray. He intercedes for us. It says with groanings too deep for words. And he basically translates 
uh, sometimes what we say and, and makes it be what we ought to say so that the Father can understand our hearts. And I don't know exactly how it works. I just know that Romans 8 says that. And so even if you don't know the right words to say, maybe you don't know anything to say at all and you're just silent with God. Don't, don't let not feeling like you know how to pray keep you from praying. A sixth reason that we might not pray or persistent prayer is that we think we just have plenty of time. I hear this from time to time. People are like, you know, I know I should pursue God. I know we should get back in church. I know I need to draw near to God. But the truth is like right now, life's too busy or, or I'm just kind of sowing some wild oats and I'll have plenty of time later and then I'll pursue God then and everything will be okay. But again, the writer of Hebrews says, do not harden your hearts like they did in the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Today, if you hear his voice, respond. Do not harden your hearts. And so I want to encourage you to not think that you have time. You don't know how long you're going to live. You, you could get sick from COVID-19 and die. Persist in prayer. Pursue your father. He wants to hear from us daily. And so if you found yourself in one of those, I want to encourage you to just understand how much the father longs to hear from us. We have a perfect father, a righteous judge who hears our prayers and who loves to answer them. We're called to be like the persistent widow who presses in on her requests with faith. And we're to see with spiritual eyes when when our life right now doesn't match what Jesus seems to say, but we're sure that we're reading the scriptures right. Then we know that we're probably in a season of Jesus saying, wait, or not yet, or I need you to learn something and then I'm gonna answer, but he's not not answering. He's answering with a wait. And so persist and try to understand the heart of God and ask him to reveal his will for you and persist in prayer. The beauty says, do not grow weary in prayer because a good God is listening who does not fear man and who will respond out of his goodness to provide for his people. That's the point the Lord wants his disciples to hear. If we come to him in prayer, seeking him in faith, he will reward us with the justice we seek. So today, if you're a believer, but you're not praying, just know that man, God wants to spend time with you. He loves you. He's not, he doesn't just love you. He he likes you. You're his heavenly child. and, And he He wants to know you. He wants to spend time with you. So persist with him in prayer. And then if if you're listening today and you're not yet a believer, you're not yet a Christ follower, there's never been that moment in your life where you know you've passed from death to life and that, that God lives inside of you and that you've been forgiven of sins. There, there is a sense in which you're separated from God right now. Isaiah 59 two says, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but um, it says, behold, the Lord's Hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. It says, but your iniquities, your sins have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So in a real sense, if you're not yet a Christian, God's ears are closed to you and he's not listening. But there's a prayer that we know based on scripture that he will absolutely listen to and answer. And it's the one in Romans 10, 9 that says, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. He's the owner. He's the ruler. He's the boss. And if we'll believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. And so I want to encourage you, if there's never been that moment in your life where you've trusted in Christ, he will absolutely hear your prayer and listen to you if you cry out and say, Jesus, save me come into my life. I've made a mess of my life. I've screwed this thing up and I know I'm sinful and I know I need to be forgiven of sin. And I know that you died on the cross for me and paid, paid the punishment that I deserved and, and then rose to give me new life. And I trust in you and believe in you today for salvation. Would you forgive me of sin? Would you come into my life? Would you change me? He'll answer that prayer. And so I want to encourage you right now, if you've never never prayed a prayer like that before, I want to encourage you to cry out to God and ask for him to save you in your own words. And he will. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new 
creature, the Bible says, the old is passed away and behold, everything has become new. And so if you're not yet a Christ follower, would you become one today? If you'd like to talk with us more about what it means to follow Jesus, you have maybe some more questions or you'd like to pray with one of us, if you go to our homepage, 24church.com, there's a messenger icon, a a Facebook messenger icon. You can click on that icon and we're waiting right now. We would love to chat with you about what it means to follow Jesus. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, You could probably even call us on the phone. If you start chatting, we'll give you a number. You could call us and we'd love to pray with you to receive Christ for the very first time. Let me pray for us and we'll be done. Father, I pray that you would challenge us today to be people of prayer. Lord, I believe from the smallest thing that seems insignificant to most people to like huge questions about what we need to do in life to to huge tragedies or hardship that may be going on in our life. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to pray about all that stuff and to believe and know that based on scripture, you care about that stuff. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Lord, help us to be people of prayer who believe that that is true and who know that you're like the righteous judge, not the unrighteous judge. Father, if there's anyone listening or watching right now and they don't yet know you as their Lord and Savior, would you reach into their heart right now? And Lord, would you draw them to yourself? Would you awaken their eyes to see that Jesus is good and he's the the best Lord we could have in our life? And would you draw people to salvation and save them today? I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, hello there. You caught me working in my office. Just want to give you kind of your closing announcements. We're glad you joined us this morning. Um, got some really cool stuff coming up. So we're renaming our food trucks. No longer Feed the Need. It's going to be called the Big Food Truck. All right. So coming June 6th, the Big Food Truck is coming here to 24 Church. We're going to be out in the parking lot and we're going to be bagging up all of the items. And so it's going to be a drive through type big food truck. Okay, so what we need, we need volunteers. Like we need people to sign up on a planning center so where they can, we can figure out who's coming. We need people helping unload, bag, hand out, pray, direct traffic. So a lot of cool things coming June 6th to the big food truck. All right. We also have our weekly kids lesson at 24church.com. You can go and see it, gather your family around, all your kids, and, and see Michael and David share a word with you guys. And then lastly, our micro churches and our Bible studies, they're still meeting by means of Zoom. And so get with your micro church leaders and they'll get you the passwords and the codes so that you can still meet and gather together digitally. And so let me leave you with our benediction. Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all you do be done in love.